Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, we are here to talk about the tax credits and incentives available to the architecture industry as a whole. Um, today, presenting is myself, Maggie Crowley. I'm head of strategic development here at Layton, and our main my main focus is to find great partners like CPAs um, to help us spread the word about these tax credits and incentives. And then we have Craig Hale, who is the SVP of our consultant team. He brings an amazing perspective because not only has he been doing this for close to 10 years and actually delivering clients and doing their R&D tax credit studies, um, but he's also a master Lego builder with his son in his spare time. And Hello. then <laughs> finally, we have Mark Bacon, who is an engineer. Um, and Mark has a really, really impressive um, <clears throat> background with engineering, specifically in 179D and 45L. And Mark, please correct me if I've left anything off about your, your experience. No, you got it. You got it. Lots of... Uh... I'll show you the map of where I've been around the country doing these inspections sometime. It's pretty much everywhere. <laughs> What's the best restaurant you've been to when you're doing these, these inspections? Oh, that's a tough one because it's regional. You gotta, you gotta figure out what the regional cuisine is, but there's a, there's a few good ones in the South, understandably. So if anybody's looking for recommendations after the webinar, <laughs> Mark's your guy. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Mark is definitely gonna be your guy for a lot of other things aside from a restaurant recommendation. Um, so leaving, leaving today and the end of this presentation, we'll keep it as quick and concise as possible. We were gonna leave some time for you guys to be able to ask questions. So please pop them in the chat as we're going through and we'll make sure to, to get them answered. Um, and then also we'll be dropping a link in the chat um, as well. So if you'd like to schedule a meeting, to speak with any of us on the webinar or another expert within Layton, we'll arrange that time. You can actually select the time yourself. So we'll drop it in there a few times. We know sometimes things come up, you might have to leave mid presentation, but you wanna know more and we'll make that happen for you. Um, so we just, we wanted to set the stage to start and talk about some of the innovation within architecture. We, we work with a number of different firms and they often are surprised to hear that there are tax credits available specifically to them and to the industry. Um, when I first joined, Le joined Leighton, Craig explained, I, I mean, I was myself wowed by all the um, innovation that actually goes on within, within the sector. Um, and Craig put it nicely the other day, which is why we have this slide depicting an older city and a, a modern day city. And if you look at the growth there, the growth is equivalent to innovation, right, Craig? Uh, a bit like that, yeah. I mean, um, I had an interesting conversation with a tax uh, inspector in the UK. I'm, I'm from uh, originally from the UK, uh, and one of the first things they said is there's no innovation in in construction and architecture. It's kind of like just a sweeping statement, I guess, to open it up. Uh, and one of the things I was always like, just look outside at the old London. And then just look that way and look at all the new London. Do you not think there's a bit of a difference between the two? That doesn't happen by accident. You need, you need some level of innovation. Uh, and when you break it down, um, how each, how you get to from one stage to the other, there's so many uh, parts of it where people have had to take a step change in their understanding. And to do that, they've basically gone through and done a load of innovation. Uh, and oftentimes that will meet the requirements that, that you're looking for for the R&D tax credit. Um, and just remember that, that ultimately the R&D tax credit itself is there to reward companies that have decided to undertake some form of technical risk with the aim of trying to, trying to innovate. Uh, and it's a really great incentive. It's the way lots of incentives should, should really work because you get the incentive after you've done the work. So you kind of have to do it, prove you've done it, and then you'll get rewarded from from the government, um, and it's not, you know, it's not a handout from the government really. Uh, if the the whole aim of it is, if, if you take it from a government point of view, is if I can reward an activity that I want to happen, which means I want innovation, I want the industry 
to, to move forward. Um, the end of it is, is you get really innovative companies, they become the market leaders, they pay their people more, they grow their business, they make more profits, and you actually get a huge return um, in, in terms of taxes, uh, whether it be profits or, or from uh, individual income. So there is method uh, to the madness. Um, but taking it back to, to architecture and that lovely conversation where you know there's no, there's no innovation, um, there's obviously huge amounts of innovation uh, within, within this space. Uh, and as Maggie said, I've actually, um, across the course of nearly 10 years, worked on uh, a number of um, architecture, construction, uh, engineering-based uh, projects. And the first thing I would kind of say to start off with is, we'll talk through, through a few examples and we're, we're trying, hopefully some of them will resonate, but it is very project specific. Uh, and it may be that you see one company doing one thing and they wouldn't actually be eligible because they don't meet all of the criteria, but what you've done would, would do. So the first thing I'll say is we have a great team of people here. Uh, and if there is anything you're working on where you go, you know what, I did take a bit of a, of a technical risk. I did uh, try something that didn't work. I did try to, to stretch and, and forward our knowledge within, within our company. Then it's definitely worth a conversation. The worst thing that will come from that conversation is us saying, right, this is what you did. You don't qualify, but this is moving forward how you could qualify. And this is what you, you would be doing. So whatever your situation is always worth having that discussion uh, with, with an expert, with, with us uh, to try and uh, to try and qualify it. Um, so a couple of uh, a couple of, of, of examples. Um, oh, sorry. Did you want to run through that, Maggie? Yeah. So um, I guess what we wanted to do there was just let you guys know you're in the right place and you're about to have the right information shared with you. Um, today, we're gonna talk about the research and development tax credit. Craig's gonna share some pretty awesome stories about work that he's done and clients that he's delivered. And then Mark will talk about 179D, which you may have heard of, but there've been a lot of changes that have made 179D way more attractive to the industry. And then we'll also talk about 45L, which is energy efficient home credit. So um, we'll start off with the research and development tax credit. Um, I'll just give you guys a, a brief overview and then we'll get into the examples, which I think really help it resonate a lot more. Um, but the R&D stands for research and development. And people often, when they hear the name of it, they're like, no, that's not for me. I'm not doing R&D. But a lot of the regular activities that you're doing just to keep your business afloat and, and keep yourself innovative actually is R&D. And this is a tax credit that was put into place back in the 80s. Back in the 80s, it was intended for larger businesses like Google, Apple, those who were creating something new for an entire industry. And then in 2015, the tax credit was made permanent and there was one key change that really made it applicable and exciting to um, nearly every business is that the innovation and the new and the work that you're creating doesn't have to be new to your business. I mean, sorry, it doesn't have to be new to an industry. It just has to be new to your business. So what the R&D tax credit rewards is the, the work and the, the projects and that you're, you're doing and completing to, um, to make your, your business better. So we will help you guys identify if you qualify for the R&D tax credit. And the next slide, I'll, I'll share with you how we actually do that. Um, but let's say you do qualify. What the R&D tax credit does is it offsets your income tax liability. And if you have an income tax liability that might be larger than the credit, you or sorry, smaller than the credit, you can carry it forward for a period of, of 20 years. So well, as Craig had mentioned before, the intention behind the credit is to help businesses continue to innovate and continue to invest money and hire, hire people, buy innovative equipment. Um, I think the key word here is innovation. Um, so I'll, let, I'll share, sh shoot this over to Craig to share what qualifies um, in the world of architecture when we're trying to understand if a business would be a good fit to claim the R&D tax credit. Thanks, Maggie. Um, so as I kind of mentioned previously, it'd be very specific to, to the company, so the projects that they're, they're working on. 
Um, and what it ultimately boils down to is, are you as a business trying to enhance something that you do? So for architecture, it could be the, the models that you put forward. It could be the, the, the schematics. It could be um, the development of, of new techniques or new structures or, or new processes. Um, if you're trying to do that, uh, then the question is, do you know how to reach the next level in what you're trying to do? And the R&D credit is there to reward and capture all the costs involved in basically trying to, to figure it out. Um, a lot of the clients that I've worked with uh, historically, so apologies if some of this may be a bit dated because I haven't done it for a few, um, I actually haven't worked on a claim for a few years, um, but there would be um, a huge move towards um, prefabrication. So it was a case of how can I build buildings incredibly quickly? Uh, ultimately, how can I take a, a large building and break it down so that I can actually do much more of it somewhere else. And then I can just do the construction element of it is, is much smaller. Uh, it's just literally, you know, take it to the extreme. I just crane in the building and bolt, bolt the bits together and I just keep stacking it up. Uh, the the um, genesis of that is usually from the architect. It's usually, I'm aware of this new technology. I'm aware that um, there's this new thing coming out. How can I apply it to this client who's looking to, to do this? Now, the client will want ultimately to just go, here's the designs, here's how you're going to do the building, but you need to get from this new technology to the point where it meets the client's brief. And it probably isn't going to be something you can do uh, straight off the bat, and there'll be a number of iterations. Um, what, what parts of it can we actually prefabricate? Uh, is, it, is it the structure? Uh, can we actually prefabricate entire rooms? Could we uh, prefabricate multiple levels? Uh, and then it'll become to a case of, you know, I've done, I reckon we can prefab loads, but it doesn't fit on the back of a truck. So now what do I need to, I need to iterate again to go, okay, what bits can I fit on a truck? Then it's a case of what, you know, do I need to split this down? Where do I split it down? And so you can just see how there's all these iterations in, in design um, back and forth. Um, that's ultimately uh, research and development. Now to qualify that a little bit more, it's for the research and development tax credit, it has to be grounded in the fundamentals of the hard sciences, so physics and, and biology. So with architecture, it would usually fall under sort of the umbrella of civil engineering um, for those sorts of projects. We're also starting to see um, a lot of projects come up on the software space for um, architecture. Um, so it could be uh, with uh, BIM models. So there was a lot of uh, evolution where clients were trying to move through the BIM, BIM levels and you're trying to fully integrate with everyone within the construction framework from architect through to um, a, a plumber or an electrician. How do all the individual elements fit together? How do we, how, if I change this, this sizing now to change the, the height of the room, how does that impact the, the, the cabling that we need and, and the plumbing that we need? And again, that whole model, not just the model, but the processes around how do we actually make this work was a huge uh, a huge innovation uh, effort. And in that, that instance, it wasn't just the architect company that was part of it. There's also other uh, industries that were coming from architects um, that were also innovating to try and figure out how to embrace this new technology. But it fundamentally always comes back to how am I trying to improve my, pro my processes, my products that I'm trying to, to, to offer? Uh, and what effort have I expended trying, trying to figure it out? Um, Another example, I know these ones are probably a little bit extreme, um, was around uh, 3D printing. So um, I'm gonna build up a, a, a huge, uh, a huge um, external building envelope and I don't really wanna waste time uh, putting up all the internal non-load bearing walls. So what if I could figure out a way to get a, uh, some sort of automated system to come in and 3D print the internal walls? And in this case of, you know, what materials could that be? When, when can they actually get into the site? Um, where are we actually going to do it? How, what, what application method are we going to use? How does this whole process um, um, look? And in that instance, the architect actually got into um, elements of robotics. How do I control this? Um, how can I get something parked outside the building to come in at a certain time? And if, you know, you're building multi-stories, how does it get into the story? Do we store it somewhere? Um, and what's the process we're, we're going to go through to, to get it to work? Um, all these elements kind of tie together um, to try and figure out, is it possible? Is it going to be a value add? Am I going to gain knowledge from it? 
And, and the great thing is that from doing all these things, when it comes to the next project, you've got all this knowledge that you've built up that you can then apply straight away. And if you want to push yourself again, you then have to go, can I do it quicker? Can I do it cheaper? Um, you know, can I make it more environmentally friendly? Um, and talking about other uh, interesting projects I've worked on, um, some of the most interesting and, and uh, more so in the, in the UK, but it would resonate here is where you have some historic buildings and uh, for whatever reason, whether it's listed or it's a nice feature, you want to keep part of that building. Uh, so one of the most interesting ones I came across was it was a five story building and uh, they wanted a hyper modern uh, construction behind it. And the architect had to figure out how do I keep the entire facade from the building there while we construct behind it? How do we take down the old building? How do we put up the new building? And how do I keep everything in, in place? Uh, and that was a huge, huge effort. That took many years to try and resolve that. A lot of back and forth, um, a lot and lot of uh, options were looked at to try and figure it out. And, and at some point, you know, it comes down to how are we going to join the two bits together? What kind of bolts are we going to use? What's the stress going through that? And it can get quite, quite in depth. And then it comes through this whole evolution. Well, if you're going to change the thickness of that, that now means that the sizing in that room that I wanted is completely out. So now we need to, we need to change all these um, parts of it. So there's Did just- Did they do it, Craig? Sorry? Did they build the five stories and keep the facade intact? Yeah, yeah, it's in central, right in central London. It's a quite an impressive building. Yeah, they did it. Cool. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's, there's a huge, huge spectrum. Um, but what I've always found quite interesting is when you actually start talking to architects and, and engineers and you go, well, what did you actually do? Was that actually easy? Uh, and did you gain knowledge from that? Uh, you start to see that lots of elements of the work they do has huge potential. Uh, to qualify for the research and development um, tax credit. And that's why it's always worth a discussion, whichever way you, whichever way you look at it. You don't need to be, design, be designing, uh, you know, the football stadiums in Qatar and trying to figure out how to air condition them. Uh, you don't need to be building the world's tallest skyscraper. Um, it can come down to, I'm building this building. Um, how do I get it to meet this uh, energy specification? Um, so that the, the power consumption of the building is, is a minimum, which could be which way do I face the building? Where do I put the, where do I put the glass? What insulation materials am I going to use? How does that all come together? Oh, that's too expensive. Okay, well, now how do I figure out? Well, I'm going to use a cheaper material, but that changes the load bearing capacity. How can I design that out? So everything just kind of blends together and you end up with quite a long, uh, a long path of, of this iteration. Um, of which you're basically incurring R&D uh, costs. Speaking of costs, how do we turn this, all these efforts into a tax credit? Um, so when we, once we identify what Craig was just discussing in the different projects that will be eligible for an R&D tax credit study, we then look at the costs associated with those individual projects. So the first area and tends to be the, the biggest bulk of the um, credit are the salaries of those directly involved, directly supporting the R&D effort or the, those projects, and then those that are directly supervising. So those are typically the W-2 employees. Then we can have a look at the subcontracted expenses um, in, in 1099s. And then um, we also have a legal team who will analyze some of those contracts to make sure that they are in the favor of whomever's looking to claim the R&D tax credit. It's definitely important to make sure you're including contractually that the, the cost is eligible to be included within the R&D tax credit study. And then we also look at the raw materials and supplies used to conduct the research. And then also any, this is sort of outdated IRS language, but computers externally leased for conducting research. So. This might be uh, like a development platform similar to like Microsoft Azure. Um, and so we would analyze that and then match them up to the um, activities. And there, that's how we would actually build the amount of qualified research expenditure that you would be eligible for. And then the actual calculation for the R&D credit is a percentage of the qualified research, research expenditure and that's available at both the state level and at the federal level. Each state has a has you know they vary it varies from state to state. 
and some states are better than others. Um, but either way, there is it, it's available um, at the federal level and state. So I know we've we've given you guys some examples, but this is what it actually looks like when you break it down into a case study and look at the numbers. So we worked with an architecture firm and 21% of their time qualified. So they were spending, maybe they you know had a hundred projects in the year and 21% of them had some new aspect or innovation or something that along the lines of what Craig was sharing. 0% um, of the supplies qualified. The company was 15 employees. The key projects were improved technique, improved energy efficiency design, and um, automated MEP control system. And they were able to get back $82,000 for over the course of three years. So this you know, clearly can be a really worthwhile endeavor. I think it's something I forgot to mention before, by the way, is that if you've never claimed this tax credit before, you can look back by, by three years um, so you really, if you haven't missed out, you have the ability to look back, which is great. Um, I don't want anyone on this call thinking they've missed out because you can still do a look back. So please pop your questions in the Q&A. We're going to move on to discussing um, 179D and energy efficiency. But if you have questions for about R&D, we want to answer them. Um, but we do want to continue to educate you guys. So I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Mark Bacon to lead the conversation with 179D. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So it's interesting listening to a lot of what Craig was saying because we talk about there's no innovation in architecture or engineering, but we're sitting in a room right now that's got a lighting occupancy sensor in it. Now, 15 years ago, that would not have existed. Somebody somewhere realized that the technology around motion sensors has increased to the point where we can use it to make our buildings more energy efficient just by turning lights off automatically. So, I mean, these things exist and we're even seeing trends now. Occupancy sensors are used in a lot of places, but I'm starting to see daylight sensors. So just taking advantage of things like, let's look at natural light coming into schools, build a lot more curtain walls with a lot more window, and then we can use daylighting to reduce our energy expenditure as well. So there is a fair bit of you know, research and development that goes into that. So it's kind of interesting to see that, you know, the people who are doing the R&D eventually end up with these things in buildings that I'm inspecting later for these energy efficient commercial buildings. So um, by all means, if you're an architect or engineer, definitely look into these uh, because these incentives are in place for a lot of you. And that really ties into what 179D is because why does 179D exist? Well, it's a deduction, not like a credit. It is a deduction, but it is available for designers and owners of energy efficient commercial building property. So why does that even exist? It's been around since 2005, just at the end of 2005, they launched it. So 2006 and on, you can take this deduction. And it's there because you may or may not know that, depending on who you're talking to, somewhere between 30 and 40% of all energy use globally actually comes from these buildings, specifically commercial buildings. So if you look at, well, why do we need to be innovative in the space? Why do we need to drive this behavior? It's because every BTU that you don't have to produce is useful. Every BTU saved through energy efficiency, very critical. And uh, those of you out there with uh, kids who are looking at graduating from college soon, fastest growing career is energy efficiency. So I would encourage you to look at that uh, on a side note. Uh, but what the reason why this exists, like I said, is really to drive that down. Uh, when it was launched, it was worth up to $1.80 per square foot of qualifying energy efficient property. Now you see on the slide there, I've got $5 per square foot and I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but it's evidence of how important this incentive is to the industry. It started at $1.80. It has been consistently extended and the government has doubled down on it over and over and over again, extended it, expanded it. It's because it's important. It's got support, pretty much everybody. It's good for energy efficiency. It's good for corporations to be able to reduce their taxable income. So there's a lot of reasons why we wanna be doing this. So it is specifically for your HVAC and hot water, interior building lighting, and your building envelope. So those are the factors. If you are doing anything that makes any of those three systems more energy efficient, there's a pretty good chance you're going to qualify for this potential tax deduction. And it is made a permanent part of the tax code. So if you have not heard of it, 
there's a really good chance you didn't hear about it because your CPA or whoever else may not have paid a lot of attention to it up until the end of 2020 because you couldn't count on it from a tax return. You never knew if it was going to be extended. So a lot of CPAs weren't necessarily paying a ton of attention to 179D, but now as a permanent part of the tax code, you can now use it for future tax planning. So when you're building out these energy efficient buildings, it's something you can consider as you're going forward. <clears throat> now it does require a couple things. And I hope if nothing else, the lesson you learn from listening to me here for the next few minutes is that 179D is relatively complex. There's a lot of nuances. So you wanna make sure you're working with someone who understands it really well. I've done somewhere between three and 4,000 of these studies. Uh, like I was joking around with Maggie, you get a look at where I've been in the country. I've been kind of everywhere doing these. So uh, toss me some questions. You're not likely to throw too many at me that I haven't seen, but I love, I love getting your questions. Um, but it does require an energy model, which in itself is a fairly complex feature. And then an on-site visit by a professional engineer or a contractor licensed in that state. So we're able to do that all across the US. So I would really encourage you to start looking into it and make sure you're working with the right partner on this. Uh, so the big thing is similar to R&D, you can look back three years uh, through amended returns and you can carry forward your 179D deductions. And if you go to the next slide, Maggie, we'll talk about just an example to give you an idea of what this has looked like, some studies we've done in the past. Uh, if you're looking at these industrial and office buildings, they're very common. There's a lot of them around. Uh, they're not necessarily as energy efficient as they should be. If they're new construction, obviously they're a lot better, but I think the stat out there is like 50% of buildings that are already built will still be here in 2050, something to that. I can't remember exactly what it is, but a lot of new construction taking place, but a lot of old buildings have to be renovated as well. So please look at this potential deduction for new builds and then retrofits you're doing as well. Uh, but in this case, the building was about 110,000 square feet. The deduction in 2022 was worth $1.88 per square foot. Now you might be asking me where those numbers come from. It's because when 179D was introduced, it was $1.80 per square foot. They inflation adjusted it at the end of 2020. So for 2021, it's worth $1.82. For 2022, it's worth $1.88. And then on the next slide, we'll talk about the big carrot here, which is starting in 2023, it goes from $1.88 to $5 a square foot. So huge difference. Before we shoot to the next slide, do you mind just talking through what the what the experience is like for a an architecture yeah. firm, for the client experience from our perspective in like document gathering and ha they're having an engineer come in to assist, but is it a huge lift from, no. okay. Yeah, yeah, great question, Maggie. So that, that's pretty common. Uh, what we get is, especially for a lot of you out here as architects and engineers, you already have all the documentation. 179D becomes a little bit more of a big lift if you're looking at an older building that's been renovated and you've done say a wing of a school, then someone like me, an experienced engineer will go in and I'll look at how the rest of the building works and how that interplays with what you've done. But for new builds, it's particularly simple because a lot of times you have all the documentation. From the documentation you probably already have on your servers, we would work with you to gather that and then build our energy model and then conduct the site visit, basically a visual verification to make sure that everything that's in our energy model is accurate to how the building runs in the real world. So really trying to make it minimal lift on your end because I've done this a long time and I recognize that a lot of you out there will have your boots on the ground project managers are very, very busy. I don't want to be using any more of their time than I need to. So I'm very careful and sensitive to how your people are working and what your relationship is like with your end client, just to make sure that we're minimizing our asks. Uh, but fortunately, having done a lot of these, I can tell you pretty quickly what I'm going to need and what I don't need. And most of it is information you're already going to have. Well, that's, that is great to hear because I think is there are so many, well, there are these great credits available, but of course people have to think about their business and, um the time it might take to claim these so it's a relief to hear that it's not a huge lift and it's definitely worth it exactly like, from a monetary perspective yeah and on that last example just to talk dollars and cents sorry i didn't mention it but uh you basically it's pretty simple math you take the square footage of the building you're doing and you multiply it by the tax deduction in that year which is dollar 88 if it's a 22 project so this client took a two hundred and five thousand dollar tax deduction this is very important because it's money they can reinvest back in their firm. Particularly, we noticed during COVID, it was very, very important for these firms to be able to reinvest the money to keep employees on staff. So a really critical 
uh, item like deduction available to really help, you know, retain your good people or, you know, invest in any other way that you feel is needed. So I would really, really encourage you to do that, particularly for architecture and engineering firms. Um, we haven't talked about it yet, but there is criteria around you have to be a designer. And I can talk to any of you about that later, what it means to be a designer, but an architect or engineer, you're pretty clearly a designer, you're stamping documents, you did the design. So that is one of the key criteria on 179D. Thanks, Maggie. So getting to the highlight here, and I think if you're here and you're here for 179D, this slide is why you're here talking to me. Um, it's not because of uh, you know, any, any other factor here other than it has been expanded significantly. So if you look at 179D was, it was on the right column. It was eligible for commercial building owners. And that was actually the original intent of 179D is you're a commercial building owner. We're gonna put a tax deduction in place for you. So an accelerated depreciation so that you will build a more energy efficient building. What happened is not enough commercial building owners took advantage of this. And I think I spend 50% of my time telling people what 179D is and how great it is. So then the government said, well, let's extend it to government buildings. So whoever designs a government building, we will give you a potential tax deduction through an allocation process. So the government entity can allocate a tax deduction to you as a designer. So that helped get a little more traction. And then it just kept expanding over time. They increased the value from $1.88 or $1.80 to $1.88. Then this year, starting January 1st, 2023, they have done a few things. Um, kind of looking at the eligibility at a high level, it was only commercial building owners and government entities before. Now we've said nonprofits are available. So just think all the churches in America are now available to take a potential tax or the designers of those, all tribal organizations, all your nonprofit schools and universities. So I think one sixth of hospitals in America are actually for profit. All the rest are nonprofits or private entities. So huge, huge, just think of all these large hospitals you drive by. Whoever designed that could never take this 179D deduction on it before. They can now. So there is huge expansion of this. Uh, and they also included real estate investment trusts. Uh, now that is a little more complex just because of the tax structure of those entities, but think about every downtown in a large city, those skyscrapers are owned by real estate investment trusts. So all that being said though, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get across to you that the government is very serious about 179D, uh, very serious to expand it to this degree. And the high line here is that $5 a square foot, but what does that really look like? They did it on a sliding scale. So it's a sliding scale starting at a dollar per square foot, if you meet minimum energy savings thresholds, goes up to 250 a square foot. Now 250 a square foot is not $5 a square foot. It's because they have attached this bonus depreciation to it which allows you to move it from, instead of starting at a dollar per square foot, you start at 250 a square foot. And then for every incremental percentage energy savings above that, you go all the way up to $5 a square foot. So if your building is 50% more efficient than the ASHRAE standard that they suggest you use, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers, if you're 50% more efficient than that, you get $5 a square foot on your building. So imagine that's basically a two and a half times increase between what you got uh, last year versus what you're gonna get in 2023. So uh, I'm not telling you to not finish your buildings in 22, but any building you finished early in 2023 is very beneficial to you. So I would say the big thing here is at $5 a square foot, everybody's talking about 179D. So if you're an architect or an engineer, your subcontractors are probably aware of 179D. So you're going to want to have this conversation early with whoever owns the building and see if you can get this deduction allocated to you. I would encourage you not to sit on this one because the deduction, once it is taken, it is gone. So Mark, there, do you, it, do you find that there's sometimes um, like an architect that's trying to get the 179 deduction, but also a building owner? No, so the, the building owner, if it's uh, a private entity, you can't take it because they own it. If they are a government entity or a nonprofit or a, you know, the list here, uh, real estate investment trust, then you are able to take it. So if you're the architect for a Google building, that's Google's deduction, it's not yours. 
But if you're the architect for a local school, it can be allocated to you. Okay. Uh, but again, the key is it's effectively a first come first serve. That's not the way the tax code is worded, but what tends to happen in the real world is whoever asks for the deduction first gets it. So I would highly recommend that you be the first one to ask for it. And how early on in the process should someone be reaching out to a firm like Leighton to get this process started? Like when they first get introduced to the project, six months into the project? Pretty early. So you can't actually do a study until the construction is completed, but you can get it allocated to you before it's done. And the reason why I suggest you do that is that you don't have to worry about someone else claiming it. My caveat is that there are firms that are trying to work this into contract cost and say, okay, if you're getting a $100,000 tax deduction, I would like to reduce your contract by $75,000. Uh, the challenge with that is 179D requires energy modeling. So it is not guaranteed. I can't guarantee you're going to get $5 a square foot. So if the local school board is telling you, hey, we want to give you 179D, but reduce your contract cost, I would encourage you to remind them that this is not a guaranteed deduction, uh, just to make sure that you're not ending up in issues where uh, if you write it into a contract, which you can do, you might want to be careful on, you know, writing down your contract too much. Okay, that's good advice. Thank you. Yeah. So again, a lot of moving parts there, and I can see some questions are bouncing in here. So we're going to have a lot to go through in the Q&A, but there are a lot of other provisions associated with this. This is only you know, a 45 minute presentation. I could probably give a two hour presentation just on the changes due to the Inflation Reduction Act, but we won't do that. Um, but if you wanna know more- book a, book a meeting, click exactly. that link in the chat and book a meeting with us and we'll get everything answered. Yeah, there's a lot of nuances to this. So it is very important that you work with the, the correct provider. The challenge of course being at $5 a square foot, a lot of people wanna do this but there aren't a lot of firms out there that are qualified to do it well. So uh, obviously you're talking to me, I'm gonna tell you I do it well, but I, mm -hmm. I would encourage you to check the credentials of the people who are doing these studies to make sure that they've done enough of the studies that they know what they're doing. Well, I think Craig and I will tell you you're doing it well too. Yeah, exactly, well, I appreciate we're not, that. We're not biased or anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, so- Switching gears to 45L. Yeah. So 45L is 179D's cousin, effectively. So if you're working on a large commercial building, you're gonna do 179D. If you are building multifamily or single family homes, uh, you're probably gonna be looking at 45L. Uh, the difference being 179D is a deduction, 45L is a credit. So there's a lot of options out there, uh, especially for multifamily units because it is done per dwelling. And there's a fair bit of information on the page here. Um, I know based on looking at the attendee list of who we've got, most of you will probably be digging more into 179D. So I won't spend a ton of time on 45L. Uh, but if you've got follow-up questions, you know, happy to follow up with you later. But at a high level, what 45L is, again, it's for um, residential buildings. It used to be for three floors or fewer. That used to be a pretty clear delineation between 179D and 45L. If you're above three stories, you can take 179D. If you're below, you take 45L. They have eliminated that starting in 2023. So you can actually double dip. You can take 179D and 45L if you're a building over, residential building over three stories. So any of you who are designing kind of high rise apartments, definitely look at both. But at a high level, the credit is um, $2,000 per unit is what it was before. 2023, before the Inflation Reduction Act that we've all heard of, it goes up to potentially $5,000 per unit starting in 2023 and after. And similar to 179D, it does require on-site visits and energy modeling. Um, it's for the last three years. So we're looking at buildings 2019, 2020, and 2021. Um, or sorry, in this case, it's going to be 2021, 22, really. Uh, we are in 2023 now. I sometimes forget. <laughs> but... Uh, and then moving forward, obviously a lot more valuable at that $5,000 square foot. They have changed the energy standard that you use. It used to be ResNet, uh, anything before 2022. Now they're moving over to Energy Star. I'm sure you're familiar with Energy Star appliances and um, just a basic energy rating. So the government's really trying to 
bring everybody onto the same page in terms of how we're going to rate energy for homes. So they've said use Energy Star. They're also looking at using net zero ready homes. Uh, very few builders are doing net zero ready homes at the moment. I think we're going to see a lot more momentum on that, but Energy Star is a lot more common. Just a quick background for you. So 45L, I mean, it's kind of what I said here. So in this case, one of the examples of what we've done, um, three-story building, nine units, just a residential rental property, placed in service in 2021. So it was at that $2,000 tax credit rate. So in this case, the client was able to get an $18,000 tax credit to use on their return. Uh, obviously, some designers are doing much larger multifamily complexes. It is a bit of a volume game. So if you're doing a lot of these, I would really encourage you to look out early. Um, but a lot of options here in terms of 45L. Great. Well, thank you. Um, Thanks, please pepper those questions in. I'm just going to talk for two seconds about who we are as a firm. Um, we are Layton, and our, our <clears throat> mission is um, to help businesses continue to innovate in a sustainable fashion. So meaning... Um, we don't necessarily want them to have to seek additional funding. This is funding that is available to you. Um, might be pretty complex to figure out, but that's what we're for. We were founded in 97. Um, so we've now been in business for 25 years. We actually just celebrated our 25th year anniversary. Um, we are a, a global firm. So globally, we've got about 2,500 employees. We've got north of 25,000 clients. We're spread across 13 countries uh, and we're growing. The, the tax credits and incentives are a really excellent market here in the United States. And we continue to um, bring on different types of credits to that are available and relevant to the market. Um, so keep following us, but let's get into the questions. So we have got a couple from David Christensen. Um, I believe this is in regards to the R&D tax credit. The question is, what if expenses are subcontracted? Innovative design work is in another country. So no 1099 involved. I, I believe they just changed the rule on this, right, Craig? Uh, I'm not sure they just changed the rule. I'd have to check with the team, uh, but typically, the U.S. credit is designed to incentivize U.S.-based expenditure. So as a general rule, if, if um, expenditures incurred overseas, it's usually a no uh, to be able to include them. But David, we can, if I'm right, which I, maybe I'm not, we can certainly um, get back with you. But I would recommend book a meeting and we'll get your questions answered in regards to that. Um, and then his other question is, can tax efficiency deductions be taken only for items outside of code required strategies or only alternatives to code requirements? Yeah, so I think uh, David, your question probably more specifically aligns with 179D. So the government wants to incentivize people to create these energy efficient buildings. So what they have done recently is they've affirmed ASHRAE 90.1 2007 as a standard that we use. So if you are building to current building codes, you are significantly beyond that. The idea being that we want to bring everybody up quickly. So these renovation projects on older buildings, we want to increase their energy efficiency. They didn't want to set a baseline standard that you wouldn't be able to exceed. So if they had used, say, ASHRAE 2019, it would be very difficult to exceed it by 25%. So they're still using 2007. So I think that's like kind of a long way of answering your question that Yes, we are using an older standard, but it is for the reason of incentivizing everybody to become more energy efficient. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. James Roseberry, a uh, beautiful name, by the way, I love that last name, <laughs> has an interesting question about the, for 17090 retrofit. I understand a 17090 retrofit has been modified to allow comparison of pre and post renovation EUI. How does this apply to renovation of vacant abandoned buildings where there is no prior EUI established, but the performance would obviously be below the ASHRAE 90.1 or national averages? James, my friend, I started this saying, you know, no one's gonna ask me questions I haven't heard of, and then you did. So, <laughs> Thank you. Is it? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. 
I actually don't know what they're going to do on that one because the energy used before would be zero because it's abandoned. So I think they might not, I mean, I'd have to, I can't speak on behalf of the IRS what they would do here, but it might be better to do the actual full 179D study in that case, because the EIU is really, like you said, it's intended to be a comparison of how much energy was there before and how much energy is after. So I think you might not be able to do that at all. I think you would have to do the full 179D study because it is comparing to a baseline standard that we can actually energy model, if that makes sense. I don't, I don't think the alternative calculation will be available in that case. Okay, thank you. Well, we will get back with you, James, as we look into um, contacting the IRS to get an answer. Yeah. Um, Jason Hart, if building has an architect and engineer under their contract, can both the architectural and engineering firm take 179D or just the engineer? How's the credit parsed up? Uh, I love that question, Jason. It comes up all the time. So the the code on that says that is up the discretion of the building owner to decide who the designer is. Now, they actually have final rights to decide. So they can say, I'm going to give 100% of it to James. I'm going to give 50% of it to someone else. They could give you 80% and then someone else could take it. It is really their discretion to decide who the primary designer is. So again, back to my point from earlier about being in the door first you want to be having that conversation early. There are some areas and some governing bodies that will say you have to go out to the market and look to see if there are other designers, but there are very few and far between that do that. Most of them will say building owner decides who the designer is. So you don't want to be late to that party or they may have already allocated all of the deduction elsewhere. All right, Todd. Verwers is wondering if we can confirm whether or not the R&D credit deduction, it's a credit by the way, not deduction, applies to architects designing custom residential projects. The answer, Todd, is yes, it will apply to that. We can't say yes to every, it would apply to every project. We'd have to understand and look at each project, but it certainly is still applicable for residential, not just commercial. Thank you. My pleasure. Michael Holiday, how would we best follow up to see how these energy efficiency rebates and tax credits may apply to our architectural firm? The work we, we have done for the past three years, as well as several of our past and not current nonprofit clients. Um, Michael, if you click the link that is in the chat, it'll guide you to a calendar to book a meeting and we will you'll be able to schedule a meeting with an expert and we'll get all your questions answered. Yeah, so Michael, we can look back at some of your work and just pretty quickly tell whether or not they're gonna be eligible projects and worth pursuing. And then it becomes a conversation with you, especially if you're doing a look back on what amended returns look like, what your current return looks like, but we can kind of put together a holistic package. I've done a lot of firms where we'll just do the back three years all at once and just get it all done at once and say, we'll look at everything, run through all of it. And then we have someone who's wanting to be mysterious, an anonymous attendee, who's wondering on the three-year look back, the three years applies to when the building was put in service or design completed. For 179D and 45L, it's in service date. And they specifically use the term of when it's ready for its intended purpose. So that comes up if you're building a shell and it's got tenant improvements or something like that your placed in service date will be when you had it ready for its intended use. So there's some intricacies there that if you're building for someone else, you're going to want to talk to someone at Leighton just to try to figure it out. But that is the way it works. Rachel Frankel has put a more of a, not a question, but a, a comment. Nonprofits and governments don't pay income tax. That's why designers of buildings owned by such entities are entitled. Yeah, that's true. So that's exactly what it is, is a government entity. And I get this question fairly often from a school board superintendent will ask me, well, hey, Mark, why can't I take the deduction? And I say, how much tax did you pay? And they will say none. And that's why you, can't. <laughs> you, you don't pay taxes. You can't take a tax deduction. Uh, yeah. But in order to incentivize everybody, we're saying, let's get the architects, engineers, GCs, energy service contractors. Let's incentivize them 
to build energy efficient buildings. Going off what you were saying about first come first serve on claiming the credit, does that mean if one of your consulting engineers applies for the credit that the architect cannot? Yeah, so it, it's interesting. Um, you don't wanna be late on that one because what may happen is, it, it's really a client relationship question. So who else are you working with on the project and what do you think they're going to do? Are they gonna to try to go after 179D? If you wanna come in after they've already gotten it allocated to them, what does it mean for your business relationship? So what I would do with you is I would work with you and say, okay, let's say you are a mechanical subcontractor from the architect and you put in the HVAC. The architect is that definitely a designer. You as a mechanical sub may have done design work or you as a mechanical engineer who subbed out to an architect probably did design work. Both of you are eligible. So the question becomes, does someone take it first at 100% or do you come together with the other firm and say, we're gonna split it 50-50? Uh, what happens though is people forget about 179D. They don't take action on it. And then you go to look at it in January and then find out that the architect took it or the engineer took the deduction three months ago. So it's very important to be in that conversation early because if you're late to it, it may be too late to make any changes. Um, we have Matthew Long who's asking about our pricing and Matthew, we will absolutely answer that for you, but because this is, this webinar will be shared on YouTube, we don't typically provide pricing in a public forum. Um, so please schedule time with us and we can discuss our pricing structures, but I will tell you they're, they're good. They're nice and they're fair. Um, but we I'd encourage you to, to schedule a meeting to learn more. And then we have another question from Matthew. For 179D and 45L, do affordable housing deals structured with low income tax credits qualify? This yeah, so the, for, oh, sorry. This is yeah. for nonprofit clients, but they have a different tax structure with a portion of it being for profit. Yeah, so to your first question there, Matthew, it's the low income tax credit is, they're putting a lot of effort behind that as well. Um, as far as I know, they're separate. The thing is they are both, they're very important to look at both of them to figure out what it does to your unique tax situation. So obviously you can't take more credits than you have income to offset. Um, so you want to look at all of this holistically, and that's really something you need to look at with your CPA and whether or not you can double down on these and actually use them. So I guess, uh, kind of a long answer to say, check with your CPA on that to see if you're available to use them both. I know the low income tax credits are getting a lot of attention now, and they're kind of the primary focus area for a lot of the Post Inflation Act regulations. They're focusing in on that and they're gonna move their way through to some of these other incentives. So we're gonna see a lot more direction on that first, I suspect. So you'll be leading the charge on that one if you're able to qualify for those. Um, to your question about tax structures for nonprofits, Sometimes they do end up with very unusual tax situations where some of it is, like you say, for-profit. Um, the building could be owned by a for-profit, but maybe it's part owned by a nonprofit or there's some unique um, tax structure setup. I would encourage you to check in with your CPA on that one. I mean, at, at Layton, we, we have CPAs, but we are not a CPA firm, so we can't really offer you advice on how best to capture that. But what we can do is we can help walk you through what that structure might look like. And once it starts getting fairly complex, I would encourage you to reach out to you know, your CPA, try to understand the organization structure on whether or not they're able to allocate it. It's very important to understand whether or not it can be allocated to you. We've often had people look back and say, okay, we thought this was a public entity. And then we found out it was actually owned by a private entity. So we can help you do a little bit of research into that just to uh, help figure out whether or not it can be allocated to you. Um, all right, and our final question is from James Rosenberry. Um, and we dropped the link, by the way, in the other chat box. Rachel, I think it probably would make sense for us to continue the conversation. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have enough time to do it here. So please schedule time with us and we um, will set up a, a session. Um, the final question from James, do you, do you do state and federal historic tax 
work as well, tax credit work. I haven't so, yet. <laughs> yeah. I, was, <laughs> I would love to. It sounds, it sounds more interesting than inspecting a boring new building to have a look at some of these historic buildings, but to date, I haven't done any of them. No, it's not, it is not a service that we currently offer the historic tax credit. Um, but we can absolutely look into what it might be like and if it's if there's a big enough market for it. All right. Well, I want to give a big thank you to everyone who joined this webinar today. Um, we will post this on YouTube uh, if you want to share it with your your colleagues, friends, and please feel free to reach out to us at any time. The email is in the bottom left corner of the screen and you also have the link available to you to schedule a time with someone, uh, with an expert, with Mark, um, or anyone else on our, our tax, tax credit and incentives team. And we look forward to working with you guys. Stay tuned for more webinars that we'll be hosting and We'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Craig and Mark, for for joining us in this webinar today and sharing your expertise. It's much appreciated. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, guys.